Hi, welcome to the channel. So today I'm going to be discussing that divorce cannot end a God-joined marriage. So first of all, I want to explain uh, what a God-joined marriage is. So this is usually a marriage, or most often it's a marriage of two single people who've never been married before. So once they are joined together in holy matrimony, uh, once they get married, uh, divorce cannot end that relationship. The only way that relationship can end, that marriage can end, is by the death of one of the parties, which I'll, I'll cover later. So another instance of a marriage that God can join together is obviously if you're widowed, then you're free to marry and God will join you to someone else as long as they are single um, themselves or widowed. And the other marriage that God will join together is a marriage of somebody who has been in a non-God joined marriage. So therefore, if you're in a second or third, if you marry a divorced person, then they are still in a God joined marriage with their first spouse, if it was their first spouse. So if you marry them, you might be legally married, but God won't join you together because it's clear. And I'll, um, that's what I'm going to be talking about later, that the Bible is clear that uh, remarriage is adultery. And so if you've married someone who's divorced, then in God's eyes, he, they're still joined to that spouse that he joined them to when they married them. So if you leave that relationship and you get a legal divorce just to end it legally, you're free to marry because you've never been in a God joined marriage. So they are the marriages that God will join together. And once he joins them together, and I'll cover the verses later, the Bible's clear that if you leave that marriage, that God joined marriage, and try and marry someone else while your spouse is still alive, Jesus calls this adultery. So obviously, well not obviously, but I've been researching this because I'm divorced and when I got divorced I didn't know that remarriage was adultery because I hadn't been taught that. Obviously the state doesn't say that and the laws that the state made um, don't support uh, that remarriage as adultery, do they? They say it's fine to get remarried. Um, but also the Church of England, which is an institutional church in England, that also allowed um, for divorce. And at the time I got di at the time I got divorced, I think you could only get remarried in a registry office, not a church, but it's still allowed for it. So at the time when I was um, getting divorced or my, my, my first husband asked for the divorce and I started to ask around about whether it was OK to be divorced or not. Uh, he didn't want to reconcile. I did. And I was at theological college at that time studying theology with um, many people who were training to be church leaders. So I asked around quite a few people um, whether I was OK for me divorced or not. I didn't want to be, but I thought, well, if my marriage is over, I may as well just I need to just accept this, don't I? So as a Christian, I ask these people and many people in in leadership positions and training to be in a leader, lead, leadership of the Church of England and not one of them told me that I was in a lifelong covenant. Um, they all said that although it, it is, you know, it should be lifelong, the reality is, and I was told that it was more like a contract and you can break a contract and I was obviously told that you could divorce, you know, for adultery, desertion, cruelty, then, then or abandonment and actually I was a Christian my first covenant husband wasn't a Christian I became a Christian after we separated so basically he wouldn't reconcile so they said that I'd been abandoned basically and so I could get divorced I was very young I'd just become a Christian and so I foolishly I guess listened to what they said I hadn't got to that point where I studied the Bible in deep depth on my own you were sort of encouraged to listen to the vicar, uh, the church leader. And these days, we're all more encouraged to study the Bible for ourselves. But in those days, we weren't. So I finished up divorced. So and the rest is history. I've got a lot of videos on my channel if you want to uh, find out exactly what, what happened to me and how I finished up to where I am today. But the reason I'm making this video is because I'm interested on how um, we finish up in England allowing for divorce for any reason. I don't think you even really have to have a reason anymore. 
So, well, I'm not going to go back to the beginning of time. I will do that, not the beginning of time, to the beginning of maybe, you know, when the, when the Bible was written. I'm not going back that far now. I'm just going to go back a couple of hundred years because the first law was 1857. Um, before that, you couldn't get divorced in the UK. So the so basically there was a law passed through Parliament and I have read all the discussion before the law you can read it online I'll, I'll put a link to it below it's really interesting so many of the people in this discussion in parliament i guess they were mps um they 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 weren't necessarily religious and they were really guarded and really concerned about what they were going to do they knew that they, if they opened the doors to divorce the floodgates would open and they were some of them were really concerned i think it's great that they were really worried about it these days you wouldn't get people really worried about it in parliament would you <laughs> that their concern is to make divorce easier not harder so in 1857 there was a law passed that um, you could divorce for desertion adultery or cruelty i um, mean women could divorce men before that they hadn't been allowed to but still hardly anyone did divorce because it just wasn't the thing to do and also it cost money and it was very difficult so people just People didn't have, they couldn't afford it. And you had, the law had to go through Parliament. It wasn't like it is today where somebody in local solicitor in your town would do it for you. So there weren't very many laws. Oh, yeah, I also wanted to, I also wanted to mention that it was Henry VIII, wasn't it, that started the Church of England? And on what, why did he start the Church of England? Because he broke away from the Catholic Church because they wouldn't let him divorce his covenant wife, Catherine of Aragon. There is some amazing books written about Catherine of Aragon and what she went through. And I'll leave some links below, actually, to a couple of the books I've read. She um, was his covenant wife and you know what she went through because he married like five other people after her. But she stayed faithful to him until the day she died. And she wrote to him and she wrote down a lot of her feelings. Um, basically, she stood for mar her marriage till the day that she died, which is amazing. Good for her, hey? But basically, that's where the Church of England started. And the Church of England is our institutional church in England. And it was started because somebody wanted to divorce their wife. So anyway, back to uh, basically coming up to modern day. So after 1857, there was um, a bill passed in the 1920s where legal aid was granted. So that was going to make it a lot easier, wasn't it, for people to divorce. Um, there were huge social changes after World War One, particularly for the role of women, and so this led to women wanting to get divorced. So these, this was uh, the bill that was passed in the 1920s. Um, so there was then more uh, another another bill in 1937, um, which opened up the grounds for divorce. Uh, then in 1969, there was another bill went through Parliament, which said that you could seek divorce on irretrievable breakdown. So before that, you had to have a reason. So yeah, so cruelty, adultery, desertion. 1969, you could just divorce on irretrievable breakdown. You had to wait, like, I think it was three years or something before you could divorce for that reason. But you could do that. So 1984, at the time limit for um, waiting for a divorce was reduced from three years that you had to be married to one year. So after one year... Um, then you could seek a divorce. So the um, the most recent uh, bill, actually not, there's been one in 2022, but there was one in 2002. And what what really, really shocked me and really worried me was that this was actually not a law that went through Parliament. This is the law that the church passed, that the Church of England passed, on the back of all these other laws that the state had passed, I guess. Right, so this law that the Church of England passed Basically, it was passed into canon law by the Church of England that those who'd been divorced were now able to remarry in the church. So the church shot itself in the foot, didn't it? It ceased to be God honouring when it did that. It's one thing the state doing it, but the church doing it when it's clear in the Bible that remarriage is adultery, that the church actually did this. So you now have, you then had church sanctified adultery. Uh, because uh, church leaders could say they didn't want to marry people, but that hardly ever happened. And also anyone who was remarried that wanted to get married in the church had to like go and have a chat with a church leader about um, why they wanted to get divorced before 
um, they could they would agree to you marrying. But from my experience, so as all of my friends, the people I know, people I've sort of grown up with, I don't know anyone. Maybe one couple that's still together, and everyone else is divorced um, and remarried once or twice, probably maybe even three times. Some months. I think yeah, once or twice or maybe three times. So. We, this has all happened since these uh, laws passed in, in 2002. I've asked people, you know, who've been remarried, what happens when you go and see um, the church leader? And I've been told that they ask them what the reason why their previous marriage broke up. And but I would say in all the cases that the people who are wanting to get remarried will say that it wasn't their fault or will say that it was the irretrievable breakdown or will blame the other person. I haven't known a church say no, that they won't remarry someone. Maybe there are, that does happen, but in my experience with people I know, the church never says no. So the church is providing ceremonies for people to get remarried into a permanent state of adultery. What does that say now about the Church of England? I mean, look at Harry and Meghan. Um, that was remarried adultery. And look, how many millions watch that around the world? And yet, God calls that union adultery. It's adulterous. She is, if she is an adulteress, Megan, it says. Hang on, let me just read the Bible first. So this um, pertains to Megan, obviously millions of other people, but because this was so, you know, it was on the TV, millions watch it around the world. I was horrified watching it. So Romans 7, verses 2 to 3. For the woman which has a husband is bound by the law to, to her husband as long as he lives. That's Megan. She was married before. She has a covenant husband. But if the husband be dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. So then, if while her husband lives, she marries another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband is dead, she is free from that law, so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. How clear! That is just so clear, isn't it? So Megan is an adulteress. That is an adulterous union. And from what I've seen, and I've seen many remarriages, most remarriages are unhealthy, even if they last. They're not built on a solid foundation because God hasn't joined them together. And they they don't have the potential to glorify God because it's adultery. The second mar third marriage, like Meghan and Harry, is, a, is adultery. They don't have, you know, marriage has an incredible potential to glorify God. You know, marriage is, a marriage between a man and a woman is a reflection of Christ's relationship with the church. It says that in Ephesians 5, but not if it's remarriage. So if it's remarriage adultery, even if the marriage lasts, there will be there will be a level of unhealthiness in that union because they will be not joined together by God, not one flesh. So you'll find that there's some imbalances. And often what I've seen is a woman becomes more dominant in the relationship. And that is just what look at what's happening with Meghan and Harry. I mean I mean, look at the disaster it's been, you know, their union. Look at the fallout for, for Harry's family, for the royal family, for England, for Meghan's family. Look at the fallout. And this is because I think part of the reason is because it's remarried adultery. They cannot, it is not joined by God. This is an adulterous union that needs to be broken. Anyway, I've made another video about this on um, the Meghan and Harry situation. So... Um, I'll put a link above. I think it's this side. So back to the bills in, in Parliament. So the most recent bill uh, going through Parliament was in 2022. So last year. And basically you can get divorced. I think it's after six months and you don't even have to have a reason. So there we go. So what starts off in 1857 by some very concerned men discussing the bill that's going to be put through Parliament to allow divorce. And they were very concerned of where this was going to end up has ended up exactly where they thought it would 150, 170 years later. So now I want to go through the Bible verses and show how remarriage is adultery, basically. That's what Jesus and Paul call remarriage. And if it's adultery, it's not even a marriage. So I want to read all the Bible verses and you can see that there are no verses that in the New Testament that say um, that you can divorce and remarry. So I'm going to start with the most argued about verses. May as well get that out of the way to begin with. So these are from um, Matthew 19, 9. That's the verse that's like most often disputed. So I'll read the whole passage. 
So Matthew 19, um, from 4 to 12. Haven't you read that in the beginning the Creator made them male and female and said for this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and the two will become one flesh. So they are never again two, but one. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. This is Jesus talking. Why then did Moses command that a man give a wife a certificate of divorce and send her away? That's what he was being asked. Jesus replied, Moses permitted you, allowed you to divorce your wives because your hearts were hard, but it was not this way in the beginning. I tell you, so he's changing what, he's overruling what Moses did, isn't he? So he's taken us back to the beginning, he said, one man, one woman for life. He's overruling that Moses made some regulations for divorce in Deuteronomy 24 because people were doing it anyway. And Jesus is saying, that's what Moses did. But I tell you, and he's telling his listeners that he is taking everyone back to one man, one woman for life. But I tell you, anyone who divorces his wife, except for fornication, and marries another woman commits adultery. The disciples said to him, if this is a situation between a husband and a wife, it's better not to marry. So they knew that Jesus was saying, once you're in it, you're in it for life. So the except for fornication exception is not except for adultery. That's a different word. That's makeia. Except for fornication is porneia. It's a different word. And porneia translates as sex before marriage. So what Jesus was saying here was that he was aware, because this Matthew was written to the Jews, he was aware that the Jews had a practice called the betrothal. So basically a man would be betrothed. It's like our engagement, but a lot more serious. He would betrothed, be betrothed to his um, wife for a year before he actually married her. And um, in that year, he was like build a house for his wife, get everything ready. And then he would go and fetch her when everything was ready. And then they would actually get married. So if in that period she'd committed fornication, he could divorce her. So that's the only reason Jesus gives here for divorce. And he's not giving an allowance for adultery because why would the disciples say, if this is the way it is between a man and a woman, it's better not to marry. They wouldn't say that, would they? They're just saying, oh, I just go and have adult, go and commit adultery and then the marriage is over. No, they didn't. They knew that it was permanent. That's why they were so shocked. So, I mean, even in Matthew, you can see the evidence for this. Matthew one nineteen, Joseph was going to divorce Mary. I mean, they were they were called husband and wife, you see, because they were betrothed, even though they hadn't been through the marriage ceremony or consummated the marriage. The Jewish, once you were betrothed, you called your spouse, you, you called your partner husband or wife. So that's why Jesus is saying here, when he when they're talking about husband or wife, it, it includes people who are betrothed. And the Jews who were listening would have known this. So Joseph was going to divorce Mary because he thought she committed fornication because she was pregnant. It's obvious, isn't it? And a bit later on, actually, I have to put the verse below. I'm not sure who it was. It might have been the Pharisees. They were discussing that Jesus was born of fornication. So, again, they knew that they thought he was conceived um, of fornication. So I'll have to put that verse below because I can't exactly remember where it is. But I know that that's what, someone, that's what a group of people were saying about Jesus, that he was born of fornication. That's another piece of evidence you don't need commentaries you don't need to study it you don't need to look things up on the internet or buy books it's there in the bible in black and white you know fornication was um being unfaithful in the betrothal period because the the man had paid like money he paid a dowry for the woman he expected a virgin on his wedding night so if she wasn't and she committed fornication then he could divorce her so anyway these the other verses in matthew 19 9 so that we can see that there, in those verses, there's no reason for divorce. There's no allowance for divorce. So, again, we go to Mark 10, uh, verses 11 and 12. Anyone who divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. Luke 16, 18. Whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Oh, yeah, and we also looked at what... The, um, the word adultery obviously is mock here and what tense it was in and it's the continuous sense so basically you don't just commit adultery on the first night i've heard people say that to me even before i knew about marriage permanence that the adultery would just be the first night and then you'd be forgiven no this is continuous while you're in the relationship uh romans 7 verses 2 to 3 a married woman is bound by the law to her husband while he lives but if her husband dies she's released from the law of marriage accordingly she will be called an adulteress if she lives with another man while her husband is alive 
So 1 Corinthians 7, 11, to the married, I give this command, not I, but the Lord. A wife must not separate from her husband, but if she does, she must remain single or be reconciled to her husband. So basically, and a husband must not divorce his wife. If you separate, you need to remain on your own. So you're like, I, I'm. that's my position. I'm like living as a single person. My covenant husband is remarried. So I'm living as a single person, but I'm still one flesh that, you know, Jesus said, never again twain. They become one flesh and never again twain. So I'm never going to be one again, single again. I'm never going to be two separate. Me and my covenant husband are never going to be two separate people. It says never again twain, but one flesh. God joins you into one flesh when you get married. Obviously, if you're in one of those um, eligible groups to get married, which I spoke about at the beginning, he joins you into one flesh. Never again twain. Never again means until you die. And all these verses that I've just read, from Jesus and from Paul back that up so even though I'm legally divorced so obviously I've been looking into this because I'm divorced so even though I'm legally divorced in the eyes of God I'm never again twain I'm still one flesh with my husband my first husband so I was married in between I was mar I married a second time but God will not take that into account he can, yes I had a legal marriage I had two children in that legal marriage but in the eyes of God I was never again twain I was one flesh still because the verses that I've just read out to you in the New Testament prove that if you get remarried, you're committing adultery. You can only be committing adultery if you're still one flesh. If you're still in the eyes of God bound to your uh, covenant husband or wife. So why is the church allowing remarriage? It's a stain on the church, isn't it? That it allows remarriage in its doors. And this is why I'm divorced. Part of the reason is because these laws, the state were passing laws and the church caught up and started passing laws themselves, itself. If the church had stood firm on marriage being permanent, I think that would have affected me as a Christian. I think I'd have known that. So the church is partly responsible for me being in the situation I'm in and for thousands and millions of other people around the world now because of what happened to Harry and Meghan. I mean, Harry and Meghan's relationship cannot last because it's, it's a stain on the Church of England that they even married them. And this is what's going to happen as we go further forward. You know, the, the Church of England, which influences all the other churches in the in the UK. I'm not surprised that the Church of England, is, I'm not surprised that I'm seeing dwindling of the power of the Church of England because of what it's doing. It's supporting remarriage adultery and some Church of England some churches are also now supporting gay marriage. So its power, its its strength will dwindle. And hopefully there will be voices from the edge that will be speaking in to the church, that will be speaking the truth on this subject. And if that's you, keep speaking. And if you haven't spoke up yet, but you do believe this, please speak. Please make a video or please contact me so I can share your testimony if you don't want to share it yourself. So Jesus and Paul uh, make it evidently clear in the verses that I've just uh, read out to you that if you remarry while your first covenant spouse is alive, you are committing adultery. So this shows that divorce cannot end a God joined marriage. It might you might be legally divorced, but you're not divorced in the eyes of God because Jesus clearly said never again twain and all these verses that show that remarriage is adultery prove that that first marriage must still stand in God's eyes otherwise it would not be adultery something else I've discovered after studying these verses now for over 10 years is that in the New Testament there aren't any grounds for divorce from a God joined marriage separation is mentioned and there may be a time that people do need to separate um, but there are no grounds um, for divorce the only permission for divorce in the New Testament is to divorce from a betrothal because your wife has committed fornication in that period which was a Jewish practice in in the days of Jesus um, but it's that that practice doesn't happen anymore so that that is obsolete now that um, allowance of fornication is obsolete it doesn't apply to us um, in our culture that today it just does it doesn't apply uh, but once the marriage had been once they'd had the marriage ceremony and consummated it there was no no going back they would have, they were married and if either of them um was unfaithful they would be committing adultery then wouldn't they not not fornication 
so yeah um thanks for watching i think i'll finish there i'm happy to answer any questions or have a discussion um please leave comments in the box below if you want to